Hij maakte zijn fortuin in Moskou. Op het hoogtepunt beheerde hij bijna een miljard dollar aan investeringen met zijn investeringsfonds Hermitage. Totdat hij de strijd aanging met corrupte bedrijven en zakenmensen. In 2005 verklaart president Poetin hem een bedreiging voor de nationale veiligheid. Hij ontvlucht het land, maar zijn Russische advocaat Sergei Magnitsky die blijft achter, wordt gearresteerd, veroordeeld en uiteindelijk vermoord in een Russische gevangenis. Over zijn strijd met president Poetin schreef de Amerikaanse zakenman Bill Browder dit meeslepende boek, getiteld Achtervolgd door de staatsmafia. En hij is hier. Welkom, Bill Browder. Great to be here. Thank you for coming in from London this, uh, this morning. Um, uh, your book is timely. It is urgent. It is horrific. And it's, at the same time, it's a great read. But the reason why you wrote it is because your friend... Magnitsky died in a prison. Could you describe to us what happened in the last hours of his life? So Sergei Magnitsky had been arrested after uncovering a, a massive government corruption scheme. Um, he was being tortured in prison um, for 358 days. And they were trying to get him to confess to a false crime, to say that he had done the crime that he had um, exposed. And they wanted to get him to testify against me, and he refused to do that, and the pressure got worse and worse and worse, but he refused at every point to recant his testimony against the corrupt officers. And in the last hour of his life, they put him in an isolation cell, they chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat Sergei Magnitsky until he died. How old was he at the time? He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. And how did you hear about what happened to him? I got the call the next morning, um, and on the 17th of November, um, and it was the most terrible, heartbreaking, life-changing call I could have ever gotten. I couldn't have imagined that they would have killed him. I was preparing for all sorts of other pretty bad eventualities, like going to jail for a very long time, but the idea that they had killed him was just completely broke my world. Um, you write about this and also what happened in your life, because when this happened, you decided that you would have a new goal in your life. What was it? Well, I basically, when I was able to clear, clear aside all the heartbreak and hysteria so I could think clearly, mm -hmm. I said to myself um, that I'm going to put aside everything else I'm doing, all my business activities, and devote all of my time, all of my resources, and all of my energies to going after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And for the last 12 years, that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Which in itself, if you say it like you just did, sounds like a task that is too big for one man living in London. That's where, where you live now. Why do you think you could do this or could reach your goal? I, I never thought about whether I could do this. Mm -hmm. I, the only thought that I had is I have to do this. Um, for me, the burden uh, that Sergei Magnitsky was dead after working for me, that if he hadn't worked for me, he'd still be alive. That burden sat on my shoulders. And the only thing that I could do for myself and for my, for my own feeling of responsibility was to do everything I could every day mm -hmm. to try to make something happen, which would at least bring some justice to the situation. Right. You uh, were trying to get this Magnitsky Act, as it is called now, um, on the table in the US, in Europe. And what it basically does is to ban visa and freeze assets from Russian human rights violators. For example, the people who killed him, but also to keep the people who gave the orders. Would you um, say that, that President Putin is, is, was he, did he give the order to kill your lawyer? So President Putin probably didn't even know about him being imprisoned. He, he, he has a thousand of these types of scams going on at any one time. Mm. But I know for sure that Putin was involved in the cover-up of the murder because I saw him on live television covering up the murder. He said that, Sergei Magnitsky died of natural causes when he was murdered. He said that Sergei Magnitsky didn't uncover a fraud when he did. And so in, in the world of, of criminal justice, a person who participates in a conspiracy to cover up a murder is a criminal. Mm -hmm. And Vladimir Putin, in this particular role, very clearly on, on national television, committed a crime. You describe in your book uh, what it meant for you to fight this fight. And also that people who were teaming up with you got in big problems and even worse. What, was, uh, what happened when you tried to do this to people who were supporting your goals? Well, one of the biggest supporters of my goals um, was a man named Boris Nemtsov. He was a leader of the opposition in Russia. He was one of the most charismatic and, and best 
people to go against Putin. And he went with me around the world to lobby for the Magnitsky Act, this, this sanctions legislation. And the Russian government and Putin hated him more than anything. And I was actually here in Amsterdam, and I was promoting my previous book. And I was about to go on to a, a different television show, one called Yinik. Yep. Um, and I, I got a text message as I was sitting in the audience about to go into, onto the show, just saying that um, Boris Nemtsov had been assassinated. He was killed on that night uh, in front of the Kremlin, um, basically for standing up for Putin, uh, standing up to Putin and, and helping get the Magnitsky Act passed. So, I mean, uh, he was in Moscow. This is where this happened. Another friend of yours, uh, Karamurt, Vladimir Karamutsa, um, got poisoned while fighting this fight. What happened to you in all these years that you were very publicly putting yourself also in harm's way? Well, ever from the moment that the Magnitsky Act was passed, Vladimir Putin gave an order, basically, to everyone in his government mm -hmm. to, tr to destroy me in any way possible. They made death threats, kidnapping threats. I've been on the Interpol wanted list eight times coming from Russia. And been arrested in Madrid. I, I was arrested in Madrid. I was detained in Geneva. Um, they've constantly been chasing me around the world. There's lawyers. They're, they're making television programs about me in Russia. There, there's a whole floor of the St. Petersburg troll factory trolling about me all over the world. Still? To this day. If you, if you, if you put a co positive comment about me on Twitter, you'll see all sorts of negative comments coming directly from right. St. Petersburg about me today. So it must be terrible then for the Kremlin that, that your book now hit the number one spot, for example, in the nonfiction top 10 in, uh, on the New York Times list. In Canada, the same is happening. In your country, you're number three. Yep. Uh, do they hate this book or they don't care about you? They hate this book more than anything because what this book does is it proves that Vladimir Putin is not a normal head of state. He's not a, he's not a person who's serving Russia for the people. It proves he's a criminal. And a grubby, small criminal who's stolen an enormous amount of money. Yeah. I, in my book, I, I, I come to the uh, conclusion that Vladimir Putin, since he came to power, has stolen, he and the people around him have stolen a trillion dollars, a thousand billion dollars. You say a small, he's a small criminal, your words. He's also the president of a country that has now invaded uh, Ukraine. And not only that, but... You have been born in America, and your former president, uh, President Trump, was in 2018 on a stage with him in Helsinki, and they together held a press conference. And we want to show a clip of that, because suddenly uh, your name is being mentioned by President Putin. Let's listen. We can bring up the Mr. Mr. Browder in this particular case. Business associates of Mr. Browder have earned over one and a half billion dollars in Russia. They never paid any taxes, neither in Russia nor in the United States. And yet the money escaped the country. They were transferred to the United States. 2018, Helsinki, naturally the voice is the voice of the interpreter. Yeah. Uh, what you are saying about President Putin and claiming that he is a corrupt little criminal, he's saying the same about you. Here. Well, so so this, this, is, uh, this is classic projection. So it's like, um, you know, they kill, you know, thousands of people in Bucha, and then they say the Ukrainians did it. This is, this is how, how Putin does it. And what, what we didn't have time to see was after that, he then asked um, President Trump to hand me over to the Russians. And re most remarkably, Trump said, I think that's a great idea. Terrible. Did he even know who you were, President Trump? Had he heard about you? Um, I think he had heard about me because um, the, the, he had all sorts of um, issues with the Magnitsky Act. Yes. P President Putin wanted the Magnitsky Act repealed more than anything in the world. The Magnitsky Act is the legislation that's now causing him all these, pro all these assets being frozen everywhere comes from the template of the Magnitsky Act. Yes. So when you heard these words of President Putin, I assume... Uh, that's not funny to hear that you are being mentioned uh, and, and that there is a possibility that your president, although you have UK citizenship now, but an American president could say, well, good idea, maybe we should do it. Was that seriously on the table that Trump thought, well, maybe we can give him to Putin? It was seriously on the table. So I, I wasn't surprised that Putin was saying that because Putin has said that 
in before. various different ways right. for, for many years. But, but tr the fact that the, the most powerful man in the free world, the president of the United States of America, was ready to go along with that, that terrified me. And, and, and for four days, that, 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 um, that ag agreement, if you will, stood on the table until the Senate, the U.S. Senate, voted 98 to 0 not to hand me over, that Trump finally said, OK, we're not going to do it. Crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I was in America at the time. And normally I live in London. So I was in America. I pictured a bunch of black SUVs showing up where I was staying and grabbing me and sticking me on a rendition flight back to Moscow where I'd be killed. Yeah. You were just mentioning that when uh, your friend Boris Nemtsov was, was killed in Moscow, you were in the Netherlands in a talk show here. Next to you in this talk show is the Dutch prime minister as a guest, Mark Rutte. Um, now, you had some troubles with him about the Magnitsky Act. What happened there? So I, I had come to the Netherlands and, um, and gotten, the, gotten many members of parliament, um, Peter Omzicht, a member of parliament, uh, Short Schordsma, various other members of parliament, to push forward a, a, a Dutch version of the Magnitsky Act. And there was a vote in the parliament here in this country to do it. And he blocked it. And Mark Rutte blocked it. Mark Rutte blocked it. Yeah. Which is interesting because this happened after MH17, the flight was shot down and most of the passengers on board were Dutch nationals. I mean, I, 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 um, I really have, don't have a lot of good things to say about the prime minister here because wh why was he defending Putin? For what reason? I mean, it, 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 it perplexes me. I mean, he should have been standing up so tough. MH17 for your country is the equivalent of September 11th for the Americans. I mean, he should have been standing so tough to Vladimir Putin, and he wasn't. So, so much so that he was doing him a favor and blocking the Magnitsky Act, and I never understood that. And you never understood it. Have you, you never found an answer? I, I know the answer, which is, you know, money, dollars and cents. Didn't want to rock the boat. Putin's gas. Yeah. For example. Everything you've been talking about on this show for the last hour. Exactly. Because, as you know, and many people now in the Netherlands know as well, that here in Amsterdam, up to Zuidas, as we call it, Lots of people are making lots of money because of, uh, for example, Gazprom having their offices here as well, and uh, entities that make a lot of money, and they have their tax benefits in what some people call is the biggest pirate nest of Europe. Yeah, this is a huge offshore center for Russian money, and I, and I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of an ugly, it's a, it's a not well-kept secret that, that um, the Netherlands is, is a, a, a lot of Russian money is sloshing around here, and, and the fact that the Prime Minister wasn't ready to stand tough after MH17. I mean, I, I just don't get that. Yeah. You sing, now you singled out uh, the Prime Minister, but you also mentioned the name uh, of Peter Omtzigt, a member of parliament at the time of CDR. Uh, how would you characterize him? Well, Peter has been my closest ally and a dear friend. And when a lot of people were not being helpful on the Magnitsky case, he was. And he... And I should also mention Short Schwarzma, who is another um, member of parliament. Those two individuals were the ones who organized uh, eventually for the Dutch um, parliament to call on the Dutch government to in introduce an EU Magnitsky Act. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the Dutch government being forced by the parliament to bring it to Europe that we now have an EU Magnitsky Act. And so Peter Omzicht and Short Schwarzma um, should be personally praised for the EU Magnitsky Act. Oh, well, you just did. Um, in your book, you also describe, I'm not done with this fight. And you have new targets inside now. Um, who are you going after? Who is on the, on the hit list of Bill Browder now? <laughs> well, so w one of the things that really bothers me is that there, there's been this huge export of corruption from Russia, money laundering, all this type of stuff. And in order to export that, you need importers. And who are the importers? These are the people I call the Western enablers, these lawyers, accountants, bankers, PR firms, lobbyists, who've all been on the Russian payroll and who are, who are all sort of still there. And, and none of these people have paid a price. We're watching, you know, massacres in Ukraine, and these massacres are being funded by Western enablers. Are you, for example, saying the former Bundeskanzler of uh, uh, Germany who's on the board of uh, Putin's energy companies. Gerhard Schroeder. Gerhard Schroeder. Gerhard Schroeder. He is should... that somebody that you would target? He, he's somebody that everybody should target. It, it's, it's, it's shameful what he's done. 
He, this man has, um, uh, you know, been one of the huge, you know, you, 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 we talk about Germany for the last hour, and he had played a big role in making sure that Germany was more dependent on Russian gas. So we have this crisis that we can't be tougher on Russia because everyone's worried about the lights going out. So this is a big name, but, but so you're also singling out people in the Netherlands, lawyers here, bankers here, uh, accountants here that are still enabling Russian companies to make their money. And, and these people need to be brought out, shamed and, and legislated so that they can't do this type of stuff in the future. This is, they're effectively working for the enemy and we have a, a real enemy now. With everything you do, um, as we said before, you are on, on probably on the hit list of President Putin because you are making too much noise, not only here, but everywhere, with your book, with your interviews. You had this question before. Do you uh, fear for your life? Well, I don't spend my life living in fear because if I did, I wouldn't be on this show and I wouldn't be in mm -hmm. parliaments and governments trying to change legislation. But I'm, of course, hugely at risk. But, um, you know, Sergei Magnitsky was in a much more vulnerable position than I'm in. He, he didn't stand down. And it's my duty to him and his legacy and justice to continue to do what I'm doing in spite of the risk. We have been talking about President Putin a lot, um, your life being in danger. Many people that you worked with uh, have been poisoned or are dead already. Uh, I'm saying this because tonight there is another program on Dutch television in which we interview together with students the winner of the Eurovision Song Contest from Ukraine, Jamala. She won in 2016 and the winning song is called 1944. It's about the Second World War and what happened there. And now she's touring in Europe and uh, making a lot of money for her country. And I wanted to show you a clip of that interview that's broadcasted tonight and ask you for your response. Let's have a look. Uh, if you are in the same room as Vladimir Putin, what would you do or say to him? You are a sick, old man. And I hate you. Jamala, that's what she has to say. She's right. <clears throat> She's right. I'd go further. I'd say that um, uh, he's a psychopath. He's, um, if you look at what he's doing in Ukraine. He has no empathy, no conscience, no morals. All he cares about is his own safety and security. He's like Hannibal Lecter. Maybe he doesn't like to eat human flesh, but everything else is the same. He's a truly terrible man. Bill Brado, thank you so much for coming to the Netherlands, uh, to Buitenhof. Uh, it's a great book. Everybody should read it. Achtervolk door de Staatsmafia. Thanks again. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.